So I'm going to talk to you about simple binary encoding. Um, I think a good place to start is why is simple binary encoding relevant at an Aeron meetup? And if you've used Aeron before, you're probably familiar with methods like offer from publication, where to send a message, you are passing in some region of an agrona buffer. And the important thing to realize is that Aeron doesn't care about what data format you're using. So you could be using SVE or you could be using something else. And does what we choose as our data format matter? Well, if you're building systems which exchange a lot of messages, then how you choose to encode and decode that data can have a material impact on your latency and throughput. And this is especially the case when you're building things like replicated state machines. So, you know, things on top of Aaron cluster, say, um, because there typically you'll have a a single thread which is decoding an input message, processing it, and then encoding several output messages. And just to sort of prove that I'm uh, I'm not making it up, um, don't worry about reading the blurb or whatever, but um, if you want to go and look later, there are some examples in the wild that people have documented. This is an example from LinkedIn's engineering blog where they, ch uh, they switched some services from using JSON to using Protobuf, and they saw some significant improvements in latency at the 99th percentile and some modest improvements in throughput. Now, um, apologies at the back. Uh, you might be forgiven for thinking you've signed up for an eyesight test. Um, <laughs> I, it looked great on my 30 inch monitor right in front of my face, uh, but it is very small. Um, this is meant to uh, kind of demonstrate some of the options we have available to us. So it's a bit of a Venn diagram. Um, I'm not an expert in all of these technologies, so apologies if any are in the wrong space. We've got things like textual encodings in the gray set at the bottom, and above that in the red set, we've got things like binary encodings. And you'll notice SB sort of in its own set up on the, on the top right there. And what I want to talk about in this presentation is why, if you care about performance, SBE is a great choice. And I'm gonna to touch on some of SBE's design principles to kind of illustrate that. And those sort of correspond to some of these, these sets in the Venn diagram. So to start with, I want to talk about how it uh, uses uh, flyweights to achieve uh, kind of copy freedom and allocation freedom. And I think it's useful to have a, you know, a counter example um, to look at as well. So we're going to com compare it to protocol buffers. Both of these are schema driven data formats. So you write your schema, shove it through a code generator and out pops some code, which helps you to encode and decode messages. And what we're going to look at is a, a schema, which is representing the same thing in both uh, Protobuf and SBE, and also uh, a couple of tests, um, which exercise the generated code to encode uh, a similar message into uh, an agrona buffer, and then asserts on um, what the shape of that data is. So these are the two schemas. Um, and above them is a kind of graphical representation of the schema. So uh, the outermost level, we have my message. Inside that, we have this price, which is a my decimal. And that has a mantissa, which is a signed 64-bit integer, and some exponent. Um, the schemas aren't quite the same, but maybe we'll come back to that later. They're pretty much representing exactly the same thing, though. And what I want to focus on is how many intermediate copies there are um, when you're using something like Protobuf. So if you can imagine your application has generated some values that it needs to send out in a message, here we've got dead beef and min value. Um, these are going to be first uh, put into some builder. You can reuse the builder, so you don't need to allocate, um, but you're going to copy those values into the builder. And that's the first intermediate copy. Then before you can actually encode something into a buffer, you first need to build an immutable representation of it. So builder.build is going to create an object graph and copy those values into that object graph. And then finally, we get down to the message.write to where we can pass in a coded output stream and it will convert that uh, immutable representation and into some bytes and write them out into the buffer. And depending on what coded output stream you use, there might actually be some internal buffering within that as well. So here you've got like two to three intermediate copies. SBE works a bit differently. So it uses this concept of uh, flyweight encoders and flyweight decoders. And the analogy sort of breaks down once you start thinking about groups and variable length data. But I sort of like to think of them a bit like stencils. So you position them over 
one-dimensional stencils, to be more precise. So you position them over a, a buffer at a particular offset, and then the sort of islands in the stencil here, something like the Mantissa method, uh, know where to color in in the buffer. And the advantage of doing this is that the application generates some values to write out into a message. And when we call Mantissa, it goes straight into the buffer. There's no intermediate copy. So continuing with the kind of the looking at protocol buffers versus SBE, another thing I wanted to look at was the native type mapping that SBE uses. So not all data formats will use the same representation on the wire as you would do in memory, but SBE does. Protocol buffers is sort of sits on the boundary here um, because it uses variable length encoding for tags and optionally uh, integers, but you can use fixed size encodings as well. <laughs> Um, starting with the SBE uh, example this time around, if we look at the, the data that comes out at the bottom, so what we're asserting on in this expected string, you can see there's a region for the header where we're encoding things like uh, the schema ID, the template, the version, block length, and things like that. And then after that, we've got our mantissa encoded in little endian, and then we've got our exponent at the end. And how, it actually, how our value actually arrives in the buffer, uh, we call Mantissa. Underneath, if we follow the kind of chain of arrows, we reach our generated code, our generated encoder. And here, you'll notice there's a, if you can see it, um, there's like a plus zero, which sort of corresponds to where that bit of the stencil is. Um, it's got a kind of static offset to where it needs to write the data in the buffer. And we call into the Agrona buffer, it has some things like a capacity check, which can be um, omitted by setting some system properties if you, um, if you really care about eliminating that, that bit of cost. And then there's a check to see uh, whether the schema order matches the native order of your machine. If it doesn't, then obviously it needs to reverse the bytes. Um, but in <coughs> most cases, you'd use little endian for your schema and you'd have a little endian machine. And then finally, it uses some MISC's unsafe API to actually write that value to a particular address. So what I really want to get across is just that there's, there's not much work to do um, in, when writing out using a, a Flowey encoder. So these are, some, these are the instructions for, um, for Mantissa, uh, for the, the Mantissa setter. Um, after, um, after JIT and optimization. Uh, I can get into more detail about this if you want to talk to me afterwards. Um, but for now, just bear in mind that don't worry about reading it. It's just there's a handful of instructions um, because we're going to compare that to Protobuf. So Protobuf uses quite a different style of encoding. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, it, I've labeled these things as tag length value, which is that's the sort of representation that Protobuf uses. And this is really good if you're encoding sparse messages um, because you only need to include the bits you care about. But it does mean that there's a bit more computation to do to actually um, produce the, the message. So when we are, for example, writing out price, it's first combining the field ID, the wire type and stuff to get a tag. It's then got to know the length of the value that's encoding underneath that. So it writes that out and then it writes out the value underneath. And it's a similar story for encoding like the, the subfields of that, like Mantissa. Rather than tag length value there, it's tag variable length value, but the details aren't really that important. What's interesting is, uh, and as I said before, it's using a variable length encoding, so it doesn't look like um, big endian or little endian in the kind of resulting uh, buffer. We've got like, this def bed, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, how it arrives at that is it's taking our, our value, uh, which is our signed 64-bit integer, and in order to encode it in a variable length fashion, it first needs to convert it into a positive integer. So it uses a zigzag encoding, which is where, say, 0 maps to 0, minus 1 maps to 1, 1 maps to 2, and so on. And once it's got this positive integer, it then uh, encodes a byte at a time. So it takes the least seven significant bits of the value that it's trying to encode, and it encodes along with that uh, in the most significant bit of the byte, a continuation bit to say whether or not there's more data. So as you can imagine, there's sort of, there's a loop involved in writing and reading um, that data. And uh, as you can see, the instructions generated, and this is actually for a much smaller part of the work. So this is just, 
This is just encoding that like deathbed value. Um, this is not including writing the tag. It's not including setting the mantis on the builder. It's not including creating the immutable representation. It's just a, a tiny fraction of it, and it's far more. Uh, there are far more instructions, and they're more complex because they actually have an active loop. So, what does this translate to? Well, it translates to uh, SBE being uh, a lot faster. So, in our benchmarks, which I don't have time to go into today, um, we typically see well over an order of magnitude improvement over SBE in terms of how many messages we can encode and decode per second. But as I was saying before, that might always be the case. If your use case is like I am having very sparse data, then perhaps Protobuf uh, does a better job for you. Uh, micro benchmarks are always a bit misleading. It's better to measure actual systems. And then the, so the final area that I wanted to touch upon aligning with uh, SBE's design principles is around streaming access. So Modern CPUs are incredibly fast at executing instructions, um, but in order to execute those instructions, they need the instructions and the data available. And so they typically employ things like hardware prefetching to try and pull, uh, to speculate on what uh, data will be needed, and then uh, load those into uh, like caches which are closer to the, uh, where the execution happens. And so one of SBE's design decisions is that it allows you to, when you're encoding or decoding, access memory in a way which is only in a forward fashion, which is incredibly predictable, which means it works really well with hardware prefetching. And this, in contrast to, say, cap and proto and flat buffers, which are sort of, you probably can't see it uh, at all very well there, but they're some of maybe the nearest competitors in terms of like, using flyweight patterns and stuff like that. These uh, have representations in their data format using things like relative pointers. So you're bound to get into situations where you have data dependent loads, um, which is likely to make that prefetching a bit worse. But with, uh, with that streaming access um, comes a lot more responsibility on the developer. So if you are encoding and decoding and you don't pay close attention to the order things are defined in, in the schema, you can end up encoding corrupted data, or you might interpret things incorrectly. And there are a variety of different ways of uh, using uh, encoders and decoders safely or not. Don't worry about understanding the, like, the different descriptions here. The point is really just to say that there are safe ways of doing things, and there are unsafe ways of doing things. Um, we don't have time to go into like, much of this today, so I'm just going to touch on one particular area, which is uh, encoding uh, variable length data in a different order to how it's defined in the schema. So this is uh, taken from the Aaron IO docs website. Again, don't worry about reading all of it. If we focus on the schema to start with, you'll see that there are a couple of variable length data fields, data one and data two. And then below that, we have some code in a test um, which is encoding data two and then data one, i.e. in the opposite order to the schema. And it's putting bar in data two and foo in data one. And then at the end, we have a decoder, which is reading those out in the correct schema order. But what we get is uh, an assertion failing uh, because it sees bar in place of foo. So ideally, we'd be able to classify all of these usages of uh, encoders and decoders uh, as either safe usages or unsafe usages at compile time. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet, but it's a good segue into some of the stuff that we've been working on uh, relatively recently. So we've added support for runtime field precedence checks and DTA generation, uh, thanks to some customer sponsorship. The field precedence checks, the way this works is the encoders and decoders have a sort of state machine inside them. Um, and when you interact with them, uh, it transitions that state machine and it checks that the order of uh, what you're doing is, is, uh, is correct. The downside of that is that it has a runtime performance cost. So it's the kind of thing that you probably wouldn't want to turn on in production. The other thing is the DTA generation. So this is sort of taking a different approach. So rather than classifying things as safe or unsafe, Instead, we're just trying to make more things safe. So by copying 
uh, the data into an object graph and losing some performance in doing so, um, we're allowing things like uh, arbitrary access to different fields. So more of what you can do uh, becomes safe. And in the future, um, we are considering um, working on uh, some other bits around SBE. So one of the things is SBE's schema evolution can be a bit complex, um, and we'd like to build some tooling to make that uh, a bit safer to protect from uh, changes which would break compatibility. Another thing we have been uh, looking at is reducing boilerplate code. So this is things like generating proxies and adapters and maybe bindings into a domain model to kind of reduce um, yeah, how much code needs to be maintained and further efforts to make flyaways safer. So